Good evening, everybody. Um, I want to welcome you all to uh, our first uh, try at uh, a virtual college golf seminar. Um, in the past, we've done this in person. Um, unfortunately, due to COVID, uh, we're not able to do it in person this year. Uh, but I wanted to thank uh, all of our attendees um, and our panelists for joining us this evening. Um, just uh, real quick, uh, I wanted to introduce uh, our panelists to, uh, to our attendees. Um, we've got David Boslow, who is the uh, men's and women's coach at uh, York College in PA. Uh, we have uh, Tana Thomas, who is, um, again, the men's and women's coach at Cabrini University. Uh, we have Rob Fisher, uh, who is the women's golf coach at Kutztown. And uh, also joining us is uh, Cole Berman, who is a two-time GAP major winner, uh, along with uh, a star uh, player for uh, Georgetown University. Um, Cole, um, Cole has uh, worked his way up through the junior ranks with, with GAP. Um, I remember when he, when he first started playing as a, a little nine-holer, um, worked his way up through the junior ranks and, and, and played collegiately at Georgetown um, and is, has gone on to, to great things in GAP. Um, just to let everybody know, the, the seminar tonight will be recorded. Um, it will be uploaded to our website. So if there's anything that you missed, um, you'll be able to, to view that on our website at a later date. Um, the process for tonight is, um, again, it's more of a Q&A. There's not gonna be any type of presentations. Um, I've got a, a, a full list of questions that you've all provided uh, that I'm going to ask uh, our panelists tonight. Um, and uh, they are gonna be dealing with uh, anything from, you know, COVID, you know, how we're dealing with COVID to, um, you know, how I should build my resume to you know, what does a typical week for a college golfer look like? Um, you know, how are uh, college teams picked? You know, once I once I get to college, um, so we've got a, a really broad range of questions that I think uh, I think our panelists are going to do a great job of answering. Um, certain questions are going to be answered by all three of the coaches. Um, certain questions I'm going to have an individual coach uh, answer. Um, Cole is primarily going to be here to talk a little bit about the process that he went through uh, a few years ago when he was playing junior golf and wanted to uh, look at playing collegiately. Um, just so everybody is aware, I do have all of the attendees on, on mute, um, but if you would like to ask a question, there is a questions button um, that you can push um, and you can actually type out a question if something comes to your mind during, um, during the presentation uh, that you'd like to ask one of our presenters. And I will be able to see that and ask the presenters uh, that question. Um, so let's go ahead and get started here. So um, for our, our, our three college coaches, um, and, and David, I think I'll have, have you go first since you're you know, right next to me on the screen here. Um, I'd like the college coaches to talk a little bit about how COVID has um, affected um, the ability to play uh, college golf, um, not only again last year, but now that we are, you know, starting back up uh, in the spring here, you know, how has, how has COVID affected your ability to play and what sort of protocols do you have um, in line? Yeah. Um... You know, for everyone, it's been it's been difficult. It's been tough uh, losing our spring season in the fall. We weren't able to compete in the fall, at least for our school. We were able to practice as a team, so we still kind of did, you know, a lot of our same practices. Um, our schedule in that in that regard was the same, but obviously still not being able to compete. Um, and then this spring, you know, we're fortunate to be able to compete, and there's a lot more on the the student athletes plate now this semester with. For our school, our players are testing almost three times a week, um, 7 a.m. So they're up early to do that. Um, you know, really not being able to travel outside the, the York area or go home to see family over Easter. Like some of those challenges are difficult, but they get the opportunity to compete this semester. Um, and there's, you know, social distancing and masking and, and a lot of those, uh, I would say, 
things that are different than a normal season and how we have to balance all of that and how we structure our practices or how many players can be at a practice at once. So we have those adjustments, um, but we're just excited to finally be able to play this spring. Thanks. Uh, Tana, how about, how about uh, your teams at Cabrini? So I echo everything that Dave said. We have a lot of um, similar things going on. We have testing going on. Um, we missed the same seasons that they did. We, we were able to practice in the fall as well. Um, we had a little inner squad competition going on all fall to keep us engaged, which was which was my assistant coach's idea, and it turned out actually really well and kept them engaged. Two major things that happened for us is a, because a lot of our kids come within, you know, three states, you know, within a couple hours away, um, several, of, most of our kids moved off campus. They moved home. And um, that has made it a little bit difficult for team bonding um, things and, and, you know, just physically being together. Even though we were allowed to practice, it was difficult. Um, and the final thing that happened for us is um, the same thing that's happened to all you guys. The golf courses are absolutely jammed. Um, we, we really struggled, uh, you know, even though we do have a golf course that we get to play and it is our home course, finding tee times around member tee times was really a struggle for us. Um, so we just did a lot more practice and we were able to do that. So, um, you know, we're feeling fortunate. We're excited to get out and play as well. Yeah, I can I can imagine. Uh, Robert, how about you guys at Kutztown? Yeah, pretty much the same thing, guys. Um, it's been really difficult. Uh, we as well lost both seasons. Um, we were not, unfortunately, allowed to practice. Um, being a state-run institution, you have to follow more of what the governor decides. Um, so it's a little bit more stringent, um, whereas a private school can kind of do a little bit their own thing. But um, we had mm -hmm. to really follow the governor and what he said. So we weren't allowed to practice. We actually just got going with our practices recently. Um, we are going to play this spring, so we're super excited. Um, the one thing we weren't we were allowed to do is weight train, and that's a big part of our program. So, you know, we were at least able to um, give individual workouts, and you know, I was able to do that and um, get our kids stronger. So we took advantage of that. But actually, getting on the golf course has been um, been really really difficult. But we are back now, so we're pumped. Great, awesome. Um, so along those lines with uh, regarding practice and, and golf courses, um, if, uh, if each of you three could, could speak about, number one, you know, what course do you guys normally play at? Um, and now that you're starting back up, um, you know, how often are you guys going to be practicing uh, in a given week? Um, so Robert, let's have, you, let's have you start this time. Sure. Yeah, we play um, practice and play our home matches at Mazellum Springs Golf Club. Um, it's a fantastic golf course in Fleetwood. Yeah. If anybody had the opportunity yeah. to get out and play, it's a real hidden gem in Pennsylvania. Um, so we, we get a chance to play that every single day. What's really nice about that, what Tana said, that they you know, sometimes would struggle because golf is just taken off with COVID. They have a fairly small membership. So, you know, pretty much the course is ours after two o'clock, which is just tremendous. So um, we're going to, we have been getting going. Um, they just opened. Uh, we have a hitting eight bay downstairs that we've been in our, in our athletic facility. But um, we're going to get going full steam ahead um, starting next week. The snow is finally melted up here in Kutztown. So um, we're, we're excited about that. David, how about you guys? Where, do you, where are you playing and practicing? Yeah, a lot of similar stuff with what Robert said. Um, for us, it's uh, the Country Club of York. It's our home course. Been there for a while. Um, they definitely limited in the fall some tee times, uh, a lot of it pandemic reasons, uh, keeping our players separated, keeping members safe. Uh, this season, it's very normal. Um, it's just more structured, so our times are more put together. So a lot of mixed practices with the, the guys and girls. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, for us this, this spring, we're kind of back to more of a normal. Um, how many, time, and how many times a week? What's that? How many times a week would you say? Yeah, uh, typically during a season, we're practicing five or six days a week. The travel schedule affects that too, where it might be four or three if we're, if we're traveling a lot and playing. Um, but yeah, a typical year, five or six days a week if we're not competing that week. Okay. Uh, Tana, um, I know you live out, you know, close to where I live in, in Bryn Mawr. Where, where are you playing? We play at White Manor Country Club. 
uh, private facility, we're able to use the practice facilities, which to me is, is more important than even the playing because they have an amazing, uh, about 150 yards of, yep. of short game area they get a practice at. We, and we have two putting greens and a driving range, which is really, really helpful for our program. Um, they do get a play there when uh, the tee sheet permits it. And uh, we also play as guests at uh, Whitford Country Club from time to time, and we have hosted there as well. So we have some nice relationships around, and we try to go to more than just our home course uh, to utilize different facilities. Okay. Great. Um, so with, uh, with your seasons all starting back up, uh, one of the questions that we got, um, and this is kind of a, a twofold question, is how do you determine, um, you know, who plays in a tournament? Um, and, you know, with, uh, with that, do you mostly play one day events or, or multi day events? Um, so Tana, on the, on the division three level uh, where, where you are, um, you know, how, uh, how do you, how do you pick, you know, the, the team that, that plays in a tournament? And, and like I said, is it, is it more one day events or multi day events? So I've been doing this for 20 years and my answer is very different for the guys and the girls. My girls team is only in our third year. Um, so I would welcome anyone who wanted to be on the women's team anytime. And if they had desire to play and learn the game, I'm, I'm in They're, They got a spot on the team and come on out. Um, as far as the men we're we're much more competitive. The men are, are pretty good. Uh, they have been conference champions multiple times and, um, the, the hope is that that gets them a, a AQ, an automatic qualifier to the national championship. We have a, a much different level. Um, we only have so many spots we can we can have, and as a result, um, I I follow them on the junior tours. Uh, the goal is not to have the kids go out and spend a ton of money on junior tournaments, but any tournaments that they are playing is sort of their tryouts, right? There's not a lot of point for me in bringing kids to my school and expecting to play on the golf team. If, if I don't know who they are by the time they get to my school, they're probably not going to make the team. With that said, I've had transfers and I've had situations where I've had, you know, surprises and I'll give anyone a chance for sure. Um, but as far as like an official tryout season, I don't really have that. You know, I usually know who the kid is before, um, before they arrive on campus and and that is a message to all of you uh, juniors. Reach out, reach out to your, to the coaches. Let them know that you're interested in their university, and uh, it really helps with those initial contacts from our end. Um, as far as the one and two day stuff, is it, that was your question, right? Yep, so we play one and two days. Yep. Um, so as we get better, you know, we get invited to more and more events, and they're further and further away. Obviously, more at the national level. Um, but there's only so much at the division three level that we can afford. And mm -hmm. so many of our tournaments are division or um, our single day tournaments, okay. um, but we try, we, we, we try for two day events as much as possible. And a lot of our programs in the area are getting the opportunities to, to expand and do two day tournaments. Um, as a general rule, we go to our conference championship as a two day event. So it is my goal to get the guys playing at least in two day as, events as much as I can. Um, okay. What that means is, is an expensive budget. So we try and do one overnighter in the fall and one in the spring. Um, and if we get more money and we can fundraise more for sure, we do that. Um, but I would say on average before COVID, it was about half and half. Half okay. one dayers and half two dayers where we would travel back and forth each day and then one overnight each semester. David, is it the same for for you at York, being on that on that Division three level? So for us, um, a lot of what she said is very similar to us with um, you know the local uh, players and following you know Junior Golf Scoreboard. Um, mm -hmm. For both our men's and women's teams, they're very competitive. I've won conference championships. We have automatic qualifiers for national championships. Um, so for us, over the last few years, we've tried to align our schedule for a national schedule. So we mm -hmm. travel up and down the East and coast, East coast for, you know, the fall and the spring. Um, we play pretty much in a normal year. This year is completely different because of the pandemic, but a normal year we're playing 
two and three round events um, for all of our tournaments. Um, Robert, so with Kutztown being Division Two, is there uh, any any differences? Um, not so much. It's very similar to what uh, the other coaches have explained. We do do primarily um, two and three day events. I, I don't really do many one day. Um, occasionally, um, we'll have some, but generally, it's uh, it's either combined with some some events or we go to two day multiple events. But uh, we travel a little bit more than maybe um, some of the D three programs, but not necessarily. Who knows? It's all golf, and it's pretty uh, it's pretty similar. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Um, Cole, I want to want to get you involved on on this discussion now. Um, as as again a former a former college player, um, when did you start to reach out to coaches and colleges? Um, again, you know, expressing your interest in, in in playing college golf. What was what was sort of your timeline as a junior um, in, in looking to play college golf? Sure. Um... Yeah, really for me, it was around my freshman year of high school when I began to research the landscape of, of college golf, kind of identify the schools that kind of fit my my preferences, both from an academic and a golf perspective. Mm -hmm. And from then, although coaches, you know, I, I know the rules change constantly, but coaches can't technically reply to you at that time. Um, I, I did begin to send introductory emails to coaches um, at, at many different levels. Um, and, you know, I think it's important that really regardless of the level uh, of your skill, if, if you have a passion for, for playing college golf and, and, and you think it's um, realistic that you could, whether it's at the Division One, Division Two, or Division Three level, I think there's really no, no time that's too early for you to begin to research what is out there and to begin to think about what, what you may you know, want to pursue. And what I would recommend is be broad. Do not do not be unrealistic. Do not be narrow-minded in terms of I, I just want to play for a, a top 20 school or I want to only want to play for an Ivy League school on the on the other end of the spectrum. Be be very broad because especially if if you're more on the on the younger end of the spectrum in your freshman or sophomore year, things can change a lot and, and quite quickly. And so the earlier you can have a broad mindset, the better. You're going to quickly find out what you don't like. And, and as time goes on, you'll be much better at identifying what it is that, that you want to pursue, you know, what is right for you, what is right for your family. Uh, but ultimately what you're doing is, is you're building a relationship with all these coaches. And it's very important, the earlier that you can start building those relationships, the better because ultimately if, if, if your goal is to play for that coach you're going to play for them for four years they're going to be a very important person part of your life and, and a very you know important relationship for you so the earlier you can build that relationship the earlier that you can kind of begin communicating and, and seeing what's out there the better um, so whether you're a freshman or sophomore or junior it, it, it's never you know tomorrow's a good day to start but uh, be broad um, and, and be, you know, be realistic. Excellent answer. Excellent answer. Um, Rob, a, a question for you. Um, can you maybe talk a little bit about, uh, without getting too much into the, um, you know, NCAA minutia, but, you know, what, can you talk about the, the differences between Division Two and, and, and Division Three? Yeah, I can. Um, I'm a, I'm a full-time coach for 30 years at Kutztown. I also am the head wrestling coach here as well. So I'm pretty adept of how the difference. I was a Division One athlete. Um, I coach a Division Two. It a lot of times it's um, it's the time commitment that's involved. Um, but you know the, the coaches that are on this panel, they're, they're, they're they they want to win just like Division One coaches want to win. And um, we train hard and we compete hard and we and we want to excel. But um, the main difference between Division Two and Division Three is um, you know, we have scholarships that we can offer, whereas, you know, the, the Division III, um, NCAA doesn't allow them to give scholarships. Now they have grants and all kind of things they could help you pay for college. Absolutely. But as far as athletic scholarships, there you have to go to Division I and Division II to actually receive athletic scholarship money. That That's a main difference um, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, other than that, um, there's some academic issue differences, but I don't want to bore you with that. But there are some. Um, <laughs> 
some different uh, academic issues that that Division One and the Division Two have that Division Three doesn't. But that's just that's just technicalities. But there's really not that much yeah. difference. Like I said before, it's all playing college golf. And as a Cole, as Cole said so uh, so eloquently, um, get yourself out there and you know don't set yourself where okay it's only a Division One and or bust. God, there's great college programs, Division Three, Division Two, and Division One all throughout the country, and there's just so many unlimited options for you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Rob. Uh, David, question for you. Um, how does one go about getting exposure if they don't have if if their high school let's say doesn't have a, a, a high school team yeah um outside of high school you know there's lots of individual tournaments over the summer on various tours so many junior tour opportunities now which is great for both men and women um you know there's a lot of different options to play uh local club tournaments your own club tournament whether it's the club championship um, those are some great opportunities. And as Cole said, reaching out to coaches, sending letters, um, sending swing videos, uh, scores that you're shooting. Um, you can look at every college golf roster and see where the players on their team are and kind of how you compare and would it be a great fit and just reaching out to the coaches. Um, you know, that's probably the best way of getting exposure, say, outside of high school golf. Um, uh Tana, question question for you. Um, besides scores um, for for junior golfers, you know what else are you looking at um, uh, with regards to a, a potential player, uh, whether it be male or female, uh, at Cabrini? You know, if we took scores out of the equation, you know what is is high on your list um, when you're looking for someone to to play golf at Cabrini? So I, I definitely like to look at the grades and the reason, you know, I don't make any mistake, um, you know, the grades are important, um, but mostly I'm looking at them because I want to see a kid who's independent. I, I don't want, you know, we don't have the resources at Division Three to send, when I, was, when I played golf at Arizona State, you know, we had people come to our classroom and look in the door to make sure that we were actually in, in class. We don't have the resources to do that at Division Three. I don't have the time or the patience or the interest to do that. So I need players who I can trust are going to take care of their own grades, who are going to work on them. And ultimately, I need them to stay eligible. I don't need them to be a problem in the classroom. I don't need to be doing, um, you know, we're fortunate in golf to be able to have pretty bright kids with, you know, pretty good um, backgrounds when it comes to parent involvement with their education. So you know, as long as I have a kid who's who's keeping high level of grades and has interest and, and desire to keep their grades up, um, that's, a, that's a positive sign for me. I also look for kids who, who want to get better and want to learn. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult, I think. Um, I think a lot of kids think that they all want to go to Division One. They all want to be the star at Duke. You know, they all, and, and I get that. You know, I played a, a, on a national championship team. I do get it. Um, but I think a, a little self-awareness um, and understanding where you actually are and where you plan to be is a really important quality, um, especially if you're going to decide to play in Division Three, because being a team player and understanding who you are and where you want to go is an important part of that. You know, if you think you're better than you are, um, Although confidence is, is something very important to me, and I and I try to instill it in every player we have, um, that that confidence can very easily turn to cockiness, and that's pretty uh, pervasive throughout a team, and, and doesn't doesn't do that well, especially at this level. So um, you know, of course, you know, desire and, and wanting to play better, but um, solid grades and a good solid person, which I can tell in ten minutes when I pick a kid around the 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 um you know my campus when i meet them or or spend a little bit of time zoom has been really fun because i've gotten to know them a little bit better <laughs> through body language um yep. something something we didn't used to do we used to go out and watch them on the golf course and that's not quite as common now um but you know i go out and watch a kid every now and then on the golf course i see him freak out and throw a club and you know <laughs> get mad and it's just not it, it's just it, it the first thing i think to myself is oh god i don't want to deal with that for four years mm -hmm. um so so seeing that you know being able to control themselves and 
and uh, you know have an, a good even temper is really helpful to me. It's it's interesting that you bring that up. I just you know to share you know my story just a little bit. Um, you know I I played uh, collegiately at a school called Spring Hill College in Mobile, Alabama, and that school wasn't even on my on my radar back in the early '90s when I was again going through you know the process Cole went through. And, and, you know, when I started to reach out to coaches, um, I'll never forget that, you know, my number one choice, um, the coach flat out told me that I was not good enough, you know, to play at that school. And that hurt, um, but it was a reality, you know, it was a, it was a you know, a reality check. Um, and, you know, I had to refine my search a little bit. And the school that I ended up going to, you know, had a golf course right on campus and I, and I played in national championships and it, and it ended up being, you know, the best thing I could have ever imagined. And I, I'm so glad that I didn't go to my number one choice, um, you know, because I, I don't think I would have been, uh, I don't think I would have gotten better because I probably wouldn't have played um, but I went to a school where I knew I could play from the moment I stepped on campus, um, you know, till the time that I graduated. Um, so I think that's, that's, that's important. Um, Rob, question for you. Um, when you're looking at, you know, prospective players, do scores or where they finish in a tournament, is one better than the other? Um, I, I would think scores generally, um, mm -hmm. only because, you know, I try to instill to my girls that, um, you know, you take the competition out of it, play the course, play to your best ability and try and shoot the best number you possibly can. And the team scores will take care of themselves after that. Um, so if I had to choose one for sure, um, you can't really pick what, you know, position you're going to shoot for in a tournament. You can shoot your, play your very best and, and, and fight for every score and fight for every shot and you know put that number at the scoreboard at the end and where you finish you finish so you you're playing the course you're you're playing against yourself and that's the beauty of our sport yep yep agreed um cole question for you um going back to your time at at, at georgetown um can you kind of talk a little bit about what a a typical week was like uh for you as a as a collegiate player and again you were you know obviously at a, a, a wonderful institution um but can you talk a little bit about you know the balancing of academics and athletics um you know at the division one level and and what a again what a typical week look like for you at, at you know in season sure uh, and you know this of course varies school by school but mm -hmm. i think at a high level every Every person who's going to play college golf can expect that every single day is going to be some sort of a juggling act between really three things, and that's going to be academics, golf, and, and just personal life. Um, college is obviously, especially in your earlier years, it's going to be a transition. Um, mm -hmm. I know it was for me, and so that obviously takes time, that takes thought, uh, and so every single day it becomes a time management test. And so really for us, especially in season, you know, when you add in travel to that, it becomes more complicated. And so for us, and this of course varies, but for us in season was really the end of August through the end of October. And then again, from the very beginning of March through finals really in the second week of May. Um, and, and during those periods, we would have uh, five events in which we played in, in, in each in each season. Um, those, those typically were anywhere between three days of of being away to, to five. Um, so to really each week, um, either at the front end or the back end was that event. And then somewhere in the middle was being back on campus. Classes for us, um, we had to be off campus every day at 3.15 to, to head to practice. Um, and our facilities were during the week, 45 minutes away from campus, and then on the weekends an hour. So mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're thinking through your day and through your week, when you're actually on campus, you know, your, your morning through mid-afternoon is dedicated to class, dedicated to homework, dedicated to, to anything of that nature. Um, and then from about 3.30 through about 7.30, you, you were on the golf course or, or a practice or, or in transit. And then you came home, you had dinner, and you had to study, go to the library. So it's a very full day. And then, like I said, 
you know, really most college events fall either over a weekend or the beginning of a week. Mm -hmm. So you'll likely travel either on a, a Thursday or Friday or, or Sunday or Monday. Um, so what that ends up, the complications that brings with it is you're going to miss class. Um, that is that is a given um, for for 95% of schools. You will miss class for competition. So it's something to think about. How are you going to make make you know that time up? Um, how are you going to you know make up assignments? What happens if you're going to miss an exam? And that's just really where having an open line of communication with professors will be important. Making sure that your coach understands your situation is is very important. But overall, when you're in season, you're juggling those three three different elements that I talked about, and and each day is going to be some sort of a uh, combination of academics and golf or or you'll be traveling and you'll still have academics mixed in. Yeah. I you know, I I think for anybody that's looking to to play college golf, the the one piece of advice that that I could always share is be prepared to take a lot of morning classes. You know, if if you if you're not if you're not a, a an early riser, it's uh it's going to be quite a quite a, a shock to the system because you know, I know I, all of my obviously practices were in the afternoon, you know, after classes. So I had, you know, 7.30 class, 8, you know, 8.30 class, 10 o'clock class. All my classes needed to be done, you know, before, you know, one o'clock, let's say, you know, before practice starts. So if you're if you're looking to play college golf, get used to having a lot of early classes. <laughs> um, let's think here. Okay. So um, again, for our coaches, if uh, if you wouldn't mind, can you talk a little bit about um, kind of the average scores for each of your teams that that your players? And again, I know you know we're we're, we're starting to get back into the season now after obviously a very very long time off. Um, but could each of you maybe talk a little bit about the average scores that your team uh, is shooting? Um, you know, and, and if we have to use maybe 2019, you know, figures, so be it. Um, David, if you want to, if you want to start. Yeah, I guess starting with, so based off of last season, so 2019 fall and then a tournament in the spring, um, our averages for our lineup guys and then some other guys that were on the cusp of always qualifying or getting in or just barely not getting in, um, they were right around like, Low 73, so 73.4, I think was exactly what it was. And then to like low 70, 75, 76. So that was okay. kind of the guys right in there. And last fall, so I guess a year ago, we ended up having the number one freshman class in the country for the men. So they came in and played really, really well early on. Um, and then our women's team, their averages were right around 78 to like 85 was that that gap for everyone kind of really being in, in contention. Okay. Uh, Tana, how about you? So we're a little bit higher than that. Um, I My sort of benchmark for my top five players is if you can break 80, and I mean really break 80 every single time you, you tee it up, you'll be probably traveling for us. Um, when you get around 80, um, it gets a little bit, um, a little dicey on the travel, but you'll definitely make the team. And uh, you know, the guys that are higher than that are are usually not making the travel team, but they are on the team. Anything below about 85 with desire and good grades, mm -hmm. you know, probably gonna get a, a shot on our team. The girls are totally different. Um, we're still in our third year. I'm just looking for enough players. Um, anyone sort of breaking 100 is is somebody we wanna we wanna consider. Um, but I'm really looking to recruit kid, girls that are breaking 90 at this point. Okay. Uh, Robert, how about you? Yeah, um, we take, uh, I'll take a variety of, um, I have some girls that they came in and they were, you know, breaking 110. Um, we will take them and we'll try and make them better. Uh, my average scores are uh, mid 70s to, you know, 85 and it, it all depends on the year. Um, we won the Pennsylvania Conference title two years ago, and we were all like right below 80. We we're really good that year, so it all depends. But um, we take a wide variety of girls. Again, if they're good students and great citizens and going to be good teammates, if they're shooting 110, we still want you. We'll make you a better player. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Um, as far as the the tournaments themselves, um, can um, can you talk a little bit about like I know uh, I, I get the question a lot like what sort of yardages are you normally playing from? Um, you know, as far as you know, the golf course being set up is it set up you know difficult? Is it set up easy? Um, but what sort of what sort of you know yardages do you do you normally play from uh, in tournaments? Uh, David, if you want to go. Yeah, I would say for our women, everything is almost exactly at 5,800. So okay. just for the minimum that we need of 5,800, it seems like every coach really tries to keep it at that number, as close as they can get based on their T situation. Mm -hmm. um, and our men, it's wide range. I would say anywhere from, oh boy, uh, 6,400 to the national championship of around a little bit over 7,000. Um, so every term is a little bit different and every course is a little bit different too, depending, you know, just because it's shorter doesn't mean it's, it's easier. Tana, how about you? Um, that, that's pretty consistent with where we are as well. I, I would only like to add that um, I think at the division three level, because when we have tournaments and we used to have big tournaments, you know, tournaments with 10, 12 teams coming, you usually get a wide range of players. And a mm -hmm. lot of D Division three schools, they might have a player that's pretty good who shoots 72, 73. And then you might also have a kid who struggles. And because mm -hmm. of that, it really slows play down. So my experience has been that a lot of the um, schools like to keep the, the setups a little bit more reasonable. You know, they're not trying to kill them. This is in Division I. Um, mm -hmm. It just keeps play moving, which is a huge yep. problem in, in, uh, in Division three golf. Yeah. How about it uh, at your level, Robert? And very similar to what the coaches just said. Um, our conference tournament will be a little bit closer to 6,000 yards, but generally never over that. Um, when I set up my course at Mazellum, um, it's a difficult golf course. So we try to keep it right at the NCAA minimum of 5,800, you know, to try and, again, mm -hmm. keep the pace play. And the greens mm -hmm. are so darn difficult that, um, yeah. you know, they'll get yeah. along with the yardages. Uh, it could be a killer, and the girls get frustrated. <laughs> uh, Cole, at the at the D one level, are you you know from what from what you remember, were you pretty much all the way back uh, at, at most of your events? Yes, absolutely. And yeah. I think being that we were in the Mid Atlantic or you know towards the Northeast, you, you do, and we played a, probably a fifth of our events in that in in the region um, per year. You, you do come in contact, especially you know one example is. The, event at Princeton every year. You know, Springdale is about a 6,300 yard golf course. And then you might travel somewhere and play a 7,500 yard golf course. So hmm. um, it, it does vary, but, and, and especially by region. But um, yeah, it, it, it will mirror junior golf um, and probably get a little longer. Chris, okay. I might add notably, um, I, I did an interesting little study of my own team going back 20 years. Um, I wanted to see the average between our fall scores and our spring score, scores over the course of 20 years. Um, and interestingly, it was 2.8 strokes at per player. So when you add that up, we count four scores. So it was over eight shots per team score over the course of the, the spring and the fall. That's how influential the weather and how, how rough it is on the weather in the spring around here. Yeah. Well, and that, that leads me to my next question. Um, as far as, you know, the, the tournaments that you play, um, are, are a majority of them, uh, again, local? Uh, you know, can you talk a little bit about maybe, you know, what's the farthest you might actually travel in, in, a, in a given year? Or are you mostly playing? Obviously, you've got, you, you know, the, the schools within your conference. So, you know, they're going to be somewhat local. Um, but, you know, are a majority of your events, let's say, within 50 miles, or are we talking about, you know, traveling further than that? David? Yeah, we're as far down as Florida and as north as New York, New Jersey. Okay. Um, out towards Ohio, too. So that's kind of really up and down the East Coast for us. Okay. Tana, the same for you? No, we don't have the budget that uh, York does. Um, we are furthest, uh, we go up to Farmingdale and pay, play Beth Page um, in the fall usually. 
Uh, and that's about as far as we go north and get down to Maryland. Usually um, most of it is within driving distance for the one days and for the two days, um, we'll just do the one overnighter. Uh, and then, you know, the other two days are within driving distance. So no more than usually two hours is, is the max, but okay. even that makes for a long day. But I, it's safe to assume, though, if uh, you know, if your teams qualify for the national championship, that's probably the 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 farthest trip. Are those normally not held, you know, in this area? Are they further away? They're usually in the south. Yeah, for okay. Division Three, they're usually in the in the southern. At least in the last twenty years, like more or less okay. Georgia, Florida. But we do go on a spring break trip. Most of us in the Northeast go on a spring break trip as well. Okay. How about you, Robert? Yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit closer to what Tana had said. Um, we can go to um, further distances, but you know what? As, as Cole was saying earlier about the juggling act, it's so it's so true. And if you start traveling too far, it's more time missed from class. Um, it just becomes um, it kind of becomes problematic for sure. So we try to stay within a, a fairly local range. We do do a, a double tournament in Erie, Pennsylvania. That's about a five-hour drive. Um, we play up there, beautiful golf courses along Lake Erie. Um, but I try to stay within a few hours. There's so many great teams around here. There's not a reason to take the kids out of school for extra time and be traveling, you know, all over the creation. So we try to keep it a little more local. And Cole, I take it, you know, Georgetown, um, you guys probably traveled maybe a little bit more? We did. We we host an event. We hosted one event each year at our home home course. Um, but other than that, the nine other events we were we were on the road or or you know flying. Um, so whether it was, I'd say you know eighty percent were on the east coast. Whether it was down from um, Princeton's event down to Florida a few times a year, and then otherwise we went west a few times. But um, yeah, we we definitely traveled pretty regularly. Was it was it um, mostly you know hop in the van type of travel or did did you actually fly to any events? We'd probably fly to five or six events a year. Oh, okay. And then, and then um, so those split pretty evenly. Excellent, excellent. Um, another question, um, and, and uh, just maybe talk a little bit about uh, how you uh, the coaches um, how you determine. Uh, your teams for each event? Like, is there, are there qualifying tournaments, so to speak, before each event? Or do you have, you know, do you have maybe two or three players that go on every single event? Like, how, how do you determine who, who plays uh, each week, David? Yeah, so a typical year, um, we would like to qualify for most of our tournaments. Um, and that's kind of just over the years. And I've talked to so many coaches and it seems like everybody does something a little bit different. But for what's really worked for us is we've qualified for as many of the tournaments as we possibly can. We let every single player on the team in the qualifier. And we've usually done it where the top four scores are in that tournament. And then there's one coach's selection. Okay. And then usually from that tournament, there might be an exemption from the next qualifier. You know, there's different variances with each qualifier. Some qualifiers might be for the next two tournaments if there's not enough time to do another qualifier. And again, you still have to juggle the class schedules, the weekend schedules. If the tournaments are on the weekend, are you trying to qualify during the week? So, but we try to lay out the entire plan for the semester so the players kind of know when they're qualifying and what to expect. And that's for both teams. Okay, yeah, so that was going to be my follow-up. Did you do uh, the same type of setup for your, your men's team as your women's team? Correct. So every every practice, everybody's either preparing for the next qualifier or we're preparing for the next tournament round. So that's how we've really kind of always done it. And is the qualifier, is it is it multiple rounds or is it usually just one round? How, how is that? Usually uh, 27 to 36 holes. Okay. Depending on what we have available uh, time-wise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Tana, how about you? Yeah, it's a little different for us. Um, for all the years I've been doing this, I've only really had a handful of teams that uh, my it wasn't obvious who, who okay. should travel. Um, and those players will go out and I will have them head to head. Um, so in my case, I would exempt them. When I used to coach at the Division I women's level, um, I was in the southern part of the country. Um, and so I had more time. Like we, you know, we played longer 
year round and the kids could go play and and I had much more um, intense qualifying. Um, but at this level, we it is very difficult to get two players at the same on the same day off even once a week. Um, and at my school, they can get off for you know for competition, but they can't get off for practice. Mm -hmm. So um, I just simply just don't have the days to to make that happen. So I I will try to do head to head when it's a question. Um, and that that head to head action, I'll try and get one or two in between. The other thing is the season's so short, particularly in the spring, that you know we have one or two tournaments, and and I don't have enough time to get it in. So um, especially with the country club closed on Mondays, so okay. sometimes we just have to roll with it, and we I do a lot of picking, <laughs> I do a lot of picking, but it's pretty obvious, you know, in my case. Um, Robert, how about how about a cuts down? I mean, do you have do you have qualifying events before your before your tournaments no we generally don't and again I'm, I'm you know 20 some years i started the program um it's pretty uh a lot of times it's fairly obvious like i was saying earlier we have girls shooting from 110 to, to even par so it's a wide variety it's pretty obvious a lot of the times and what we try to do over the years is um i always try to bring extra girls to every single event um, what's nice in the division two conference is we try to equate for um, not only the starting five, but other girls that we bring along. So I could use that as qualifying. Um, and, and generally I will, you know, we'll go and we'll bring three extra girls. And if they, they start really playing well, well then they gotta be considered for a spot. But I don't have the time, um, again, juggling academics, social life, personal time and, and, and um, athletics. I find it um, be almost impossible. We, it almost never play 18 holes of golf for practice. Um, we really want to work on skills on the putting green, on the short game area, and then we'll take it to the course and we'll play a handful of holes. We'll play nine max. Um, so we're really working on skills. I really want to work on them on their strength, on their conditioning, and all their golf skills. I, I just don't find it necessary or even time consuming to go out and just hammer them with uh, with all the golf. Um, along the, along the ooh, got some rebounds there. Uh, along those lines, how much um, instruction are you three as coaches providing to your players versus maybe if they have uh, a, you know uh, a pro that they that they work with at the at the club level? Like how how do you balance how do you balance that, David? Yeah, I would say a lot of our players have their own swing coaches back home, right? Um, so sometimes it's difficult for them to get there, but sending them swing videos. We have a uh, TrackMan launch monitor and a SAM potting lab here on campus. So we mm -hmm. work you know, with them a lot on those. So they have numbers that they can always send to their coaches as well. Um, we keep strokes gain statistics. We have a software program for that for every player. So everything we're doing is giving us strokes gain statistics for them. Um, so then we're very hands-on with the practices and kind of identifying the areas for them to um, focus on, get ready for that next qualifier, next tournament. But yeah, I'd say we're very hands-on with the uh, the coaching with them um, and also working with their swing coaches. Same for you, Robert? Yeah, pretty much. Um, I, I, I don't find, we're not, um, we don't have the time or the, you know, if you're going to change a swing and work on swing mechanics all the time, it's going to be really counterproductive. So like their, their actual golf swing uh, mechanics, generally my girls over the years have their own swing coach. We work much more with um, uh, mental preparation, short game, um, things like that, that we could really see a, a tangible difference. Actually trying to rebuild swings, we, I don't have the time for that. It just doesn't happen. Tana, same for you? Yeah, I am. Um... It's a little bit varies for me, player to player, because I do have so many, you know, newer girls, particularly. Um, I do a lot of, you know, helping them. But I, I agree with Robert. I do a lot of um, analyzing stats, trying to get them to think their way through the golf course. We do a lot of walking golf courses and trying to do some course management stuff. Uh, talk a lot about breathing exercises and understanding yourself. Those are the kind of things where I feel like I can really help them. I am a LBJ teaching professional, so I, I can mm -hmm. help them with their golf swing, and I do. 
I have several guys who have all invested in me, but it, a lot of that is a relationship that you build that is sort of separate from the coaching of the golf team. And I would say, you know, of my eight guys, I, I am engaged actively teaching three of them right now. The other yeah. ones have their own or they just aren't into it or, you know, they'll say something's wrong, you know, but we only talk about it when something's wrong, which is all the time. <laughs> Um, Cole, can you, you know, can you give a little bit of your perspective again as a former player and, and your relationship as far as, you know, what you would, you know, work on with maybe your, your coach at, at Georgetown versus maybe what you would work on at home, you know, during the summer? Sure. And, and at least at Georgetown, our, our coach was very much more of, the, of a non-golf, but leader. He, he himself was not much of a golfer, but he was much more of uh, making sure that we, you know, he was person first, I would say. So from a golf perspective, um, I, I probably can't give a great, um, <laughs> you know, opinion there, but I, I can absolutely speak to what what I know to be true at, at other Division One schools and with um, friends of mine who might have played elsewhere. And, you know, I think what's typical is your your golf coach is going to see your swing a lot. He's there, he or she is going to know your game as well as you do at the end of your four years, they're going to know what works for you. They're going to know what doesn't. Um, and it's ultimately, I think, you know, some coaches will approach it differently, but ultimately it's going to be up to the player to determine, you know, the extent of that relationship and whether they're going to ask for advice or, or whether they're they're not. Um, and, and some college coaches will work directly with swing coaches from home. So it's, it's ultimately, it will, it will be very much up to the player. Um, but I, I won't say, and of course, the, the, the time and the flexibility of your practice regimen when you're in season will be different than the summer when you're at home and able to go to the golf course whenever and whenever you want. But ultimately, it, it will. the player has a lot of um, discretion in, in, in terms of, of how the coach will interact with your golf swing. Um, and, and most coaches will understand that and, um, you know, proceed accordingly. Excellent. Excellent. Um, so I think that's pretty much gone through my my list of questions uh, that I've got. Um, again, I want to I want to thank Robert and David and, and Tana and Cole um, for you know for joining us this evening. Um, I did want to uh, before we finish, I did want to turn it back over to Cole. Um, Cole and I have been um, you know have been friends for a long time since his, his since his junior golf days, and we've got some pretty um, exciting uh, things that, that he and I are working on. And I wanted him to uh, spend just a couple of minutes before we end up here, just talking about um, this, this idea that we've got and what we're looking to do for, for junior golfers, um, you know, this summer and, and moving into, into the future. Great. Thanks, Chris. And, um, you know, to everyone on, on, on the other end, but, you know, golf, as, as everyone on this call can attest to, especially the coaches and Chris and myself now, um, golf has the opportunity to really change a person's life, especially when they play at an early age and, and show talent and show passion. And, and as I like how Rob has said, and, and are good citizens and good members of their community. And oftentimes golf can take you very far and it can open a lot of doors and create a lot of opportunities. Um, but sometimes that's not always, you know, it, it takes, you know, mentors and a lot of people to, involved to, to open those doors. Um, and, and that's not always accessible um, in the same levels to everyone and um, requires a lot of luck. But something that um, myself and some other, uh, and Chris and, and some other kind of amateur golfers in Philadelphia have been, have been working on how we can provide that mentorship to the passionate junior golfers in the Philadelphia area in really a centralized form um, for those who are interested in playing college golf and playing beyond. And so starting this summer, uh, we'll be starting something called the Golf Bridge Society. And the Golf Bridge Society is going to be a, a co-ed um, development organization for the high school um, age junior boys and junior girls who are really passionate about the game, want to, want to continue to play and see where golf and life can take them. And so what we'll be doing, we'll have three events in our inaugur inaugural year. Um, the first will take place July 21st at Sunnybrook um, in Plymouth Meeting. The second will take place August 29th at French Creek. 
and the third on um, October 10th at Bitterman. And each event will consist of 18 holes. Um, you'll play, each group will consist of three juniors and a mentor. The mentors will be you know, CEOs, um, high level amateur golfers or leaders of the golf community, such as you know, Mr. Mestre, the, the president of the Golf Association of Philadelphia, or Mark Peterson, the executive director. Um, and then following each event, there will be a guest speaker. Um, and guest speakers will be anyone from a CEO to a former professional athlete, coach, or someone really with great leadership experience who can teach us all, a lot about life. And the event, the, the society will be application-based. Um, we'll accept 24 um, participants in our inaugural, inaugural year. Applications will open in early April, um, and, and the process will take about a month until they close. And really what we're hoping to do is find those junior golfers in the Philadelphia area who are really passionate about the game, but also truly understand the game's meaning and understand how much, how privileged we are to have golf in our life, in our lives, and, and who are interested in learning just how far golf can take them. And, and that professional golf and playing as a pro really isn't the end all be all. There's, there's much more to this game that, than meets the eye. And um, oftentimes it just takes some exposure and some mentorship to find it uh, and doors will open from there. But for any juniors on the other end who are interested, uh, we do have a website. It is thegolfbridge.com. And if you, if you head to that website, there is a contact us page. Um, if you're interested, please submit your name, your email, and, and a brief message. And, you know, we will be in touch. You'll start to see emails and communication about the Golf Bridge Society um, towards the end of this month and in and, and early April. And we look forward to having, you know, anyone and everyone's participation in the application process and, and hope to meet some of you this, this summer. Great. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Cole. And I, I'm, you know, as a as a former junior golfer from this area, um, again, I'm I'm looking forward to helping you out. Um, you know, looking forward to to meeting everybody. Um, I want to thank again our coaches for uh, for coming on tonight, taking time out of their schedule um, this evening to uh, you know to give us some some great answers to uh, to our questions. Um, I want to wish uh, all three of you uh, best of luck with all of your seasons. Uh, I'm so happy uh, that, uh, that you're all going to be getting back out on the golf course competing. Um, so again, I want to wish you all the best of luck and, and thank you uh, for coming on tonight.